Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our November talk by the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, can you hear me? Uh, just put, pop something in the chat if you can hear me, so we know we're all good to go. Excellent, yes, okay. Uh, my name's Tom uh, and I'm your host for tonight. Um, I study meteorology at the University of Leeds. Um, we've also got with us uh, Sarah, who is our co-host um, and who is the RMET's president um, and a PhD student at the University of Leeds. And she's here to take over in case I have any technical issues. The talk is going to be 30 minutes, followed by uh, 15 minutes of questions. So um, if you want to ask any, then just feel free to pop them in the chat on the right. Um, and we'll ask them at the end of the session. Um, our talk tonight is presented by Professor Piers Forster. Piers is a professor of physical climate change and is the director of the Priestley International Centre for Climate at the University of Leeds. Um, he researches both the causes and um, the climate feedbacks of climate change in the Earth system to understand temperature and rainfall changes and improve their projections. Um, he's played a significant role um, authoring the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports and has recently been working um, at the COP26 United Nations Climate Change Conference. So it should be a very relevant and interesting talk tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Piers. Um, if you'd like to turn your, your mic on, um, Piers. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. OK. It's fantastic to be here everyone and thank you for the introduction tom so i thought i would tell you a bit about some of my work and i might kind of share my kind of powerpoint slides uh, and i absolutely i absolutely do appreciate lots of lots of discussion because i'm not exactly sure what it is you want to know about my work, or what I do. So, so I talk for a short time and we can then hopefully have some interesting discussion afterwards. Um, so I'm going to talk about the really some kind of fundamental stuff I've done and others have done on kind of, kind of climate science, but, but they're kind of but the kind of way that translates into material that we present for the intergovernmental panel on climate change documents and the way it translates into the negotiations that the governments have with each other. So I'm going to try and show you, you perhaps kind of, kind of, kind of where does the kind of work we do as atmospheric kind of kind of physicists kind of kind of where does it end up being talked about in the policy world? Um, and I thought I would begin with this slide, but this slide didn't pass very well, and somehow it got rotated and I don't know why it got kind of in a weird way but but I wanted to go back to John Tyndall that did the first atmospheric measurements of the absorption of greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere in the atmosphere of the earth now, his kind of quantitative calculations were taken up by this other scientist called Cervantia Penius, and what he tried to estim estim estimate from John Tyndall's work was the surface temperature change you get from a doubling of carbon dioxide. So he didn't only use a tumbling of carbon dioxide. He did some other experiments too, where he tried to estimate the change you get from a decrease in carbon dioxide, from a 30 or 40% increase, and from a doubling and a 
three times carbon dioxide. So he tried to do the calculations um, and he came up with the estimate for the Earth about kind of, kind of five to kind of five degrees was his best estimate. Um, but it was really interesting. He actually did see, if you go to the publication and look at what he said in it, he said, these publications, these kind of calculations were really hard work. They were dull and they were kind of tedious, but we thought it was worth doing it. So then people wouldn't have to repeat them. But it's interesting because this experiment is the Surface temperature change, in my respect, from the doubling of carbon dioxide, that has become perhaps the most repeated experiment in climate change. So he thought he would be the one of the only person to do it, but in fact, it's been done lots of different times. Um, so I do, do, do now want to go on, but this calculation he did about warming of carbon dioxide wasn't very accurate. So it took a very long time for it to be refined. Uh, and it was eventually refined in the 1960s by work by Suki Minabe. And for this work, he just won this year's Nobel Prize for physics. Uh, and what he did was to try and build a simple computer realization, a computer simulation of the way the world works. And he tried to estimate from that, in fact, this equilibrium temperature change that you would get from a doubling of carbon di dioxide. And he came up with a temperature estimate at just above two degrees. And that was the first one to really do an accurate job of doing that by including these different P packs in the climate system. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so, so that calculation by Suki Minabe was the first estimate just above two degrees. And, uh, and, and then there was one more group, in fact, in New York, led by Jim Hansen, that came up with a slightly different estimate of three and a half degrees. So we had these two estimates of the temperature change you get from a doubling of carbon di di the doubling of carbon dioxide. And, and, and then in the 1980s, so if you look on the diagram, this showed the progression of our understanding of this equilibrium temperature change from a doubling of carbon dioxide, the, the experiments. So the first report on this was kind of, was kind of produced. And this said, oh, we have these two different estimates, one just above two and one above three and a half degrees. Why, why we can't say very certain with much certainty what this estimate is of the climate, the climate sensitivity. But, but so we give it some uncertainty, uncertainty between one and a half and four and a half degrees. So it had this big uncertainty. Um, but, but the surprising thing is that even with the decades of work that had been done on this problem after, the, after that, this estimate of the equilibrium climate sensitivity, it we have been really unable to accurately constrain it. If we do build these computer simulations, the, in fact, they do work just as, 
just to do, just to do, just to do effectively with lots of different estimates of climate sensitivity. So if you have a look at the assessment in the last range of IPCC reports from the first report, second report and the third report, it it didn't really didn't really change at all. And the fourth the second report we thought, oh perhaps we can constrain it. But in fact if you look at the the fifth assessment report, this takes us all the way to twenty third 2013, we still have a big a big uncertainty. Um, uh, 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 and these these estimates did really come from these different computer simulations of of, of climate change. So, so, so the, and I think because in the fit assessment report it was particularly challenging in 2013 because we had different estimates that didn't seem to agree with each other particularly well. So, so what we tried to do was to try and really go back to the beginning to, to really, really try and work out what was going on with the different estimates to see if we can do a better job. Uh, um, yeah, so, so in fact, we did come together as the international community with my colleague Steve Sherwood in Australia, was in charge of this work. And what we tried to do was to try and go back to the evidence to look at different kinds of evidence to see if we could choose the kinds of evidence to constrain this equilibrium climate sensitivity term. And, and so the first satellite evidence was from looking at the paleo climate work. So for example, we can we can look at when there was the last ice age. And we have some idea of what the change in the surface temperature was at that time. And we have some idea of what were the different factors that were influencing the Earth's energy budget at that time. So what were the change in dust and ice sheets and carbon dioxide and things. So we could come up with an estimate of what the climate sensitivity was, and that places a certain constraint. So we tried to look at this quite carefully. Um, the ones I, I don't have time to talk about all of them today, but the ones I want to touch on are looking at the individual different kind of feedback kind of, kind of terms and trying to look at evidence from the historical time. Um, yeah, so I will go on and talk about those two aspects in particular. So, so, so it's quite interesting about, I'll just go back one slide. It's, uh, so, 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 so if you look at the constraint from the historical time, it looks like we really can't constrain very effectively this equilibrium climate response. And it's interesting as kind of why. Um, Start this diagram is not very big at all, but I, I hopefully you get the idea. That, um, uh, uh, and it's because if you if you look at what's been going on historically in the past decade in particular, there is something peculiar going on in the Eastern Pacific, especially with the Eastern Pacific surface surface temperatures. So if you look at the temperature change in the East Pacific, it doesn't seem to be warming up, not compared to the rest of the compared to the rest of the 
kind of crowd. The rest of the the rest of the crowd has has really increased its surface temperature. If you look at over the lot of the continents, they warm by over one and a half degrees. But if you look at the Eastern Pacific, the Eastern Pacific really hasn't warmed up very much at all. It's really only warmed up by 0.2 or 0.3 degrees. Uh, 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 and this creates an interesting response of the clouds. So if you look at the way the clouds have changed, um, the you, but you, what you in fact find over the Eastern Pacific, you get an in, 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 in increased temperature in person. So, 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 can I say what it means? You get an increase in temperature with altitude. Uh, 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 and, uh, and then that actually has led to a lot of those several Eastern Pacific cloud. So, 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 and that cloud in the Eastern Pacific is quite reflective. So what that does, it reflects the sunlight back up and then that does effectively keep the Earth a bit cooler. So, 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 so it's interesting. So, it is, so it, if you try and estimate, in fact, what this equilibrium sensitivity is from the historical time, you don't get a very high estimate. You end up with a number nearer to two degrees or something like that. Um, but, but it's interesting to see if this temperature effect will continue or as we expect, we expect the Eastern Pacific to in, increase the surface temperature in fact considerably, and that increase in the surface temperature we expect will lead to a decrease in the cloud eventually. So, so that we expect perhaps, or, 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 or although if we just took the historical time, we wouldn't expect a very high climate sensitivity, we do have some evidence that perhaps is bigger than that. Than that. I better go on. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll talk about that. I think I'll go on to just talk about other stuff now in my last bit of time. But, but so what I do for the IPCC report was to try and put all the lines of evidence together to try and come up with the overall assessment of what the climate sensitivity was. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't necessarily fit in with the estimate coming out of the, these, well, computer simulations. Um, so, 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 yes. So, so, Yes, so, 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 so if you look at the lines of evidence, you don't end up with the same high climate sensitivity you get from the current set of simulations. Um, yeah, uh, 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 and this in fact has implications for projections, and that's why I talk about it today. That that if you do have these high climate sensitivities, you end up in fact with a very big projection of surface temperature change for the next century. But in fact, what we want to do with the IPCC was to see if we could actually constrain the projections. So what we tried to do, we tried to take the climate sensitivity estimates to see if we could use them to try and constrain the temperature projections. So in fact, this is what we did. So we did these with these very simple climate modeling tools called climate model emulators. And what it is, they give you a simple way of exploring lots of uncertainty 
guaranteed within the simulations to come up with a range that fits in with the observations. So, so we tried to apply this with the IPCC work. Um, I won't go into detail there, but what, 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 what I tried to do, what, what we found in the work, is to look at the kind of the quickly look at the kind of look at the kind of top top diagrams, perhaps on this one here. So the top left hand diagram does indicate the temperature projections you would you would get from the CMIP six simulations. So these are the world's super supercomputer sim simulations uh, and, 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 and then the projection of 2100 on the right hand side diagram are these are the projections where we have been able to constrain them according to the multiple lines of evidence from climate s s s sensitivity. Uh, 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 and what I want to see from this is that there's a very big difference between the two. The, 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 we don't estimate the big temperature change you get from the simulation. Uh, uh, can we all so been able to constrain for the first time some of the uncertainty associated with these projections? Uh, and that was a very important result of that. It, it, it is quite quite a significant thing to be able to tell the telegus that that we have been effectively able to produce a more accurate projection of surface 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 temperature. Um so and in fact, when I was at the COP negotiations, the, you had a lot of commitments being made by different countries. We had com commitments made by India and by Joe Biden and people on cutting meat and things like that. And, and what we tried to explain to them at the COP was that kind of, kind of where the kind of certain results were in the scientific understanding of climate, uh, and we were able to go a bit kind of, kind of further than just explaining it. We were actually able to produce near real-time calculations for the delegates as well. So, so when a different country did make a commitment, we were able to quite quickly kind of calculate the effect of that commitment on the surface temperature. And, and, and we, we, we did it with these very same simple climate models with the different lines of evidence. So, so, so what this does, this does show a, our estimate of the surface temperature change we can predict from the 2100 temperature change. If we just took their 20, 20 kind of 30 commitments, so, so, so as countries made more commitments during the COP conference, you you could in fact see that it really did make a difference in the long term temperature kind of, temperature kind of targets. But as uh, well as making their 2030 commitments, they were also making commitments for net zero and trying to make had the commitment as well, uh, and and if you and, and if you did put all their commitments together, and let's say for the sake of argument they actually did 
deliver on these commitments, this is a very big if, it would be possible potentially to keep temperatures below two degrees by 2100. So, so can kind of, so he were able to really, really, really provide people with the calculations. Um, and that, and the other thing we try to get get over was really the uncertainty within the calculations. So, in my very kind of the very last slide I want to show today it is this this one we produced of a kind of roulette type uncertainty estimate for for kind of where the separate attempts might tend up is if different countries did really follow their 2030 commitment. So if you look at the left hand side one currently, you, you, you can see with 2030 commitments, the biggest chance is that you will end up with a temperature somewhere between 2 and 2.5 degrees, but you have got a chance of 2.5 and 3 degree temperature or Three degrees to four degrees, or even a little bit of a chance of a temperature above four degrees, but you've also got a chance of keeping below one and keeping keeping below two, perhaps as well. But but you, but, but you can see if pe people also commit to their not only the NDC commitment, but they also commit to the net zero targets and do deliver on those, the, then there's a good chance we will be able to keep temperatures to below three degrees. So what I tried to do was to, to give the delegates an idea of what the uncertainties were that came from their different commitments. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think all I want to try and get across to you guys tonight is, is that, that I, I think we as a community, community can be really intelligent about really producing targeted science results. Uh, uh, to, and I think by really targeting by targeting them in the right place at the right time, we can we can we can really make a difference to these both these reports and eventually to the negotiations and hopefully drive more ambition and drive more action. Okay, I think I end my talk there and then open it up for hopefully interesting discussion. Thank you, Piers. Uh, that was a really great, insightful uh, and interesting talk. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, then feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we can ask Piers now. Um, so we've got one from, uh, from Doug. Doug, oh no, you're on the line. They're going to give me a hard time now. <laughs> um, so a few years ago, the apparent um, hiatus in warming caused a setback in progress towards policy. Um, do you think this could happen again if we had a couple of years of reduced warming? Um, I Yeah, I think it was an interesting thing to talk about. I, I think 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 we were very bad at predicting, predicting it as a community, and I think we were bad at exp, 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 explaining it as a community, because it took us by surprise as well. Uh, uh, and yeah, so, 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 so what I think we, I think if it happened again, I do think we will be far more prepared and kind of really kind of far more able 
to explain what's going on and why. But I, yeah, I sort of think, yeah, I so I think it probably couldn't say that, but I, I think it be, but I think it is good to really try and make better short-term prediction and really understand what caused it and what is what is going on and things. But one one key thing we can say now that we have better observations of where the energy is going in the ocean in particular. So just because it's not going in to necessarily increasing the surface temperature, you can year on year on year on year, uh, I think we can show kind of categorically it it is going into the ocean. But I, I, I would come back to that. I completely agree with you, that I, I think we aren't good at communicating it still. If you look at the, what the WMO put out or what the Meteorological Office can put out, they still put out the annual statement going, this year is really hot, this year is really hot. Uh, uh, and there's going to be a time when it isn't hot. <laughs> uh, so, so I sort of think they don't really prepare themselves that well. Excellent. Well, I hope that uh, answered your question, Doug. Um, uh, yeah, we've got one from Barry. Um, uh, so Barry's asking, are there any thoughts on why the Eastern Pacific is cooler than might be expected? Yeah, well, it's really interesting. And a lot of people are more intelligent than me are kind of, kind of working on this, in fact. And um, yeah, um, it's probably to do with the ocean circulation El Nino type thing going on there, but, but uh, yeah, but there's a whole sort of atmosphere and ocean interactions you have to work on as well. Uh, so so if the, there is not a good explanation, and, and there's not a good explanation if it does have a cause or if it's just some peer random change. And it's interesting because if you look at these complex computer simulations, they do these big pre-industrial control simulations where they run Cheers and things, but if you have a look at all those data from all those computer simulations, they actually do not produce anything like we have observed. So, so it really does, 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 does really seem like there's something going on we don't understand it, or, or per perhaps there's something peculiarly going on. They're just way outside what we might expect. So, I think it's really important to understand it and the not only understand it, but we do understand that we have to kind of predict it as well, because if that cool patch in the Eastern Pacific will remain, that will have a big effect on the kind of projections. Excellent. Um, we've got another question from uh, Beth. Um, what do you think should be the main focus for COP27? Ah, Beth, good answer. I mean, I'm only the poor, lowly kind of <laughs> scientist. So, so I can give you two answers, maybe. The first one is if you look at the COP26 documents, there is a request in them to the <laughs> scientific community and it makes two requests I th well it makes a kind of third one as well the f the first request is to really be able to quantify accurately the impact of different incremental degrees of surface temperature so, so what is the difference between 1.5 1.6 1.7 1.8 of things they they want to really understand their different impacts uh, and they also want much more information for to pass the world to really know what's going on so we can make accurate pro pro projections for people within their community within their communities 
there's also requested well for more diversity amongst the kind of scientific community just because we have a hundred and ninety six kind of kind of countries there uh, 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 and they do they do they do they do all want the kind of science explained from someone from one of their one of their communities so 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 that was one thing we could change um in terms of the international commitments the well the, i think the pain focused on cop should be the financing that and that comes from the adaptation community and that would again try and to build international international collegiality between the different countries there was still a lot of mistrust and things because of the pandemic because we weren't sending kind of vaccinations to different countries so so, 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 so i think if we're going to exert international kind of kind of kind of pressure on India and China places to come back with more ambitious kind of kind of kind of targets. I think we can only do that if we talk as one international community and that could only become that I think if we do provide the kind of financing and and support to some of the least developed countries. That was an excellent answer, yeah. <laughs> um, and then we've got a final question from uh, from Dave. Um, have you been able to assess the increased risks of the tipping point impacts with overall uh, global temperature increases? Well, Dave, that's a very good question. And I can, I haven't done it personally, but I can really kind of tell you what's in the IPCC report. Um, fairly, the IPCC doesn't like the word kind of tipping, tipping points particularly. It does talk about things that are irreversible though. So the thing we set off like the increase in, 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 Sea level rise and the kind of pouring of the heights and things that are irreversible that we're going to be living with for millennia. Um, but but in terms of tipping point, we do look at things like dieback of the Amazon, uh, and the other one we talk about is the collapse of the Antarctic. I shelves that could collapse quite suddenly. Um, uh, and it is quite difficult to put a particular surface temperature change threshold onto the particular activities. But, 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 but if you, but if you, if, you really do look at the literature they do really only seem to be there for these very high surface temperature changes this is above three or four degrees um so so, so i think uh, 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 another thing we've learned from the IPCC report is that they're not going to occur instantly. So, so they're not going to occur at least at the end of this century as well. So they will occur at the end of the century perhaps, and, and they will occur at these very high levels of surface temperature change. So I think what that tells us is that I think think we ought to concern ourselves with them. Particularly, we ought to just try and really make 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 sure those high temperature changes don't ever occur. That we have to put all our 
effort into trying to sort, sort out what we're doing in the next two decades. Uh, yeah, so I think we ought to really kind of, kind of worry about them, kind of, we ought to kind of worry about them kind of too much. Excellent. I hope that answers your, your question, Dave. Um, that seems to be all the questions that we have got. Um, oh, what about oh, Doug? Got Doug, one. Well, Doug and another one. The Dune uh, gets two. Here we go. So it's got one last question. Um, can you see a future where the international community will take action uh, or sanctions against countries like Australia? Uh, uh, module? I know it, it, it will not ever occur at these cops um the 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 well the whole way the united nations negotiations work is that they're all done by completely completely unanimous consensus so, so and that is so important the whole united nations thing so, so you're not ever going to kick countries like australia out of that you're not ever to so, say so you're trying to bring people in so that always does, does does mean that you always go a bit for the lowest common denominator but i think the activities outside of the cop negotiation where you perhaps can begin to sanction australia there's people talking about border tax adjustments and things so perhaps they won't be able to trade and I think things like that to Australia can be quite a kind of quite a kind of powerful factor. But but the best thing in a lot of countries like Australia is to change the kind of government. So they they're heading for a general election early next year. So talk to all the Australians you do know and get them to change their government. Um, yeah, and, and then to try and deal with the Saudi Arabians, the Indian and the kind of Chinese maybe as well is, I don't know, we just have to try and think of a world that doesn't run off kind of coal and oil and kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of gas. So I think there is the, there's some chance there exerting kind of kind of kind of kind of kind of pressure from civil society, but also from industry. But but I I I think we don't underestimate well the actual for pressure of what where we can support it is kind of scientists i think we have a good role to play with that if we can take a convincing argument with the australian government to governments in africa like nigeria for example that burn a lot of coal and oil if we take a convincing argument about the about the way that kind of, the the way the climate change is really affecting and will affect their own countries, I think if we can present that to them, I think we can get them to change their behaviours. We've seen it in China; they've definitely come on board. So I, I think we can do it there. We can do it everywhere. You know. Okay. Um, okay. So perhaps we can end on a bit of kind of optimism, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, unless there's any final questions, um, I think we've got through um, pretty much everything. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope everyone who watched watched the talk enjoyed it. Um, if you'd like to rewatch the talk, then it's going to be uploaded to YouTube in the next couple of days. 
Um, and our next talk will be in December. Um, and it will be given by uh, John, Sarah and Ben, who are all from the um, Yorkshire Local Centre Committee. And they're going to be covering the seasonal selections um, of 2021 in terms of the weather that has occurred this year. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you once again to um, our speaker, Piers Forster, um, for a brilliant talk. Um, Cheers, thank everyone. You. To everyone for coming to and cheers Tom and, and Catherine for organising and sharing. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you to Catherine um, and Armets. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I hope you've had a great talk and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>